Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sustain a What webisode series, the City of Cape Canaveral's monthly virtual public outreach program designed to educate and inform residents about all the latest happenings regarding our local environment, technology, and infrastructure. My name is Zach Eichels, and I serve as the City's Sustainability Program Manager and Resilience Planner. I will be your host for today's webisode. Today, we will be looking ahead at what 2021 has to offer in terms of rocket launches. Last year, the Cape saw 31 launches occur, but this year, there could be upwards of 50 launches if schedules are kept and quick turnaround times are maintained. This increasing number of annual launches is due in large part to an increasing number of private companies that are developing and operating an expanding portfolio of launch vehicles. In recent years, this has allowed an entirely new space-based economy to flourish, and is only expected to grow, making East Central Florida one of the premier gateway points to space. So sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. Let's talk rockets. Before we showcase what is ahead, let's have a quick look back at how we got to where we are today. What follows is a brief timeline showing some of the greatest accomplishments and milestones in spaceflight history. So on October 4th, 1957, Sputnik 1 is launched by the USSR to become the first artificial satellite in space. On January 31st, 1958, Explorer 1 becomes the first U.S. satellite to reach orbit. On July 29th, 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, is formed. On April 12th, 1961, Yuri Gagarin becomes the first man in space. On May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard becomes the first U.S. astronaut to reach space aboard the Freedom 7 capsule. On September 12th, 1962, John F. Kennedy delivers his famous moon speech in challenging NASA to get to the moon by 1970. On June 16, 1963, Valentina Tershnikov becomes the first woman in space, and this is done by the USSR. On December 12, 1968, Apollo 8 becomes the first manned spacecraft to leave orbit and orbit the moon. On July 20, 1969, U.S. astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin become the first people to set foot on the moon. Between May 1973 and February 1974, Skylab becomes the first U.S. space station and is occupied for a total of 24 weeks. On July 17, 1975, the U.S. and USSR host a joint docking mission with an Apollo and Soyuz spacecraft. On April 12, 1981, the first space shuttle is launched from the Kennedy Space Center. Between February 1986 and March 2001, mankind's first modular space station, Mir, is operational. On November 20th, 1998, the first module of the International Space Station, or ISS, is launched by Russia. On April 28th, 2001, Dennis Tito becomes the first space tourist when he visits the ISS after funding his own trip. And on May 25th, 2012, SpaceX's cargo dragon capsule docks with the ISS, becoming the first private spacecraft to do so. Okay, now let's talk about where we stand today. A lot has changed at the Cape since the space shuttle retired in 2011. Let's get our bearings first geography-wise. Sometimes individuals can get confused about where what is and who does what. Let me start off by saying that the city of Cape Canaveral has no affiliation with any rocket launches, nor does it have control over any launches. The city is a completely separate entity responsible only for the day-to-day -day happenings within the city's 1.9 square mile boundaries. Sometimes individuals have arrived at City Hall believing that they have actually arrived at the Kennedy Space Center. Rockets are in fact controlled and launched from two separate facilities directly north of the city. These two facilities are the Kennedy Space Center, seen in white on the map, and the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, seen in green on the map. A majority of launches happen from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station due to it simply having more operational launch pads. The Kennedy Space Center has two operational pads, Pad 39A, which is currently leased and used by SpaceX, and Pad 39B, which is owned by NASA. These are the famous pads that saw the launches of the Saturn V and the space shuttles for decades. 
NASA is currently involved in two major programs that are guiding its direction in spaceflight, the Commercial Crew Program and the Artemis Program. The Commercial Crew Program is a human spaceflight program operated by NASA in association with, in association with American aerospace manufacturers Boeing and SpaceX. The program is intended to conduct rotations between the expeditions of the International Space Station, transporting crews to and from the ISS aboard Boeing's CST-100 Starliner and SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsules. However, only SpaceX is currently offering consistent crew transportation aboard its Crew Dragon capsule. Boeing's Starliner is still undergoing testing and will hopefully have its first crewed test flight this summer. The Artemis program is a NASA-led international human spaceflight program that has the goal of landing the first woman and the next man on the moon, specifically at the Lunar South Pole, by 2024. The program also includes technical assistance, hardware, and assets from various U.S. commercial spaceflight companies contracted by NASA and international partners that include the European Space Agency, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and the Australian Space Agency. Artemis, the sister of Apollo in Greek mythology, will comprise several components, which include NASA's massive Space Launch System rocket, or SLS, the Orion crew capsule, a lunar lander, the Gateway Lunar Space Station, and a host of other systems. The patch you see here on this slide is the official program patch of the SLS rocket. Since the Space Shuttle's retirement in 2011, the CAPE has undergone an expansive transformation in order to be turned into a multi-user 21st century spaceport. Upgrades to systems and infrastructure are ongoing and ever-changing. The image on the left is of the Kennedy Space Center's Pad 39A, now leased and operated by SpaceX. The pad has been upgraded and streamlined for consistent commercial operations, as well as continued human spaceflight. The image on the right is a shot looking up through the recently installed work platforms inside the famous Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB, in preparation for the assembly of the new SLS rocket. You can see the platforms will contour to the shape of the rocket, which has already started assembly in the high bay for its first test flight later this year. Here is a photo of the VAB's exterior. The VAB was completed in 1966 to hold the Saturn V rocket, which first brought humans to the moon in 1968. It was the largest single-story building in the world, standing at 526 feet tall, and, and at the time of its completion, was the tallest building in the state of Florida. The smaller white building in the photo's lower right corner is Mission Control, which oversees launches from the Kennedy Space Center. It has been upgraded with new telecommunications and computer systems in preparation for future launches. The KSC Headquarters Building is a new eight-story office building that houses the administrative offices of NASA's John F. Kennedy Space Center. Constructed in April 2019, and also known as the Central Campus Facility. It incorporates the offices of the Space Center Director, management staff, personnel, procurement, and several hundred contractor and support workers. The building houses 200,000 square feet of floor space. Other upgrades include the expansion of, of the facility's wharf, which is designed to unload core stages of the SLS rocket from NASA's Pegasus barge, which itself will carry core stages from Alabama, where they are built and tested before integration at the Kennedy Space Center inside the VAB. The Pegasus barge previously helped ship the external fuel tank for each shuttle flight to the Kennedy Space Center. At the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, there have been numerous launch pads acquired by private companies and redeveloped to accommodate new launch vehicles. A great example of this is Launch Complex 36, or LC-36 a concept rendering of which can be seen here on this slide. The launch complex, which is only about six miles away from the city, making it one of the closest launch sites, was used for Atlas launches by NASA and US Air Force from 1962 to 2005. Blue Origin, which was founded by Jeff Bezos, CEO of Amazon in 2000, has leased the launch site since 2015 in order to build a new launch site for launching orbital rockets. 
Orbital launches are expected to begin from LC-36 in late 2021. And the first launch vehicle slated to launch from this is the new Glenn rocket, which has been under development by, by Blue Origin since 2012. As of now, LC-36 is under major construction, but nearing completion, including for a large launch pad for the new Glenn with a nearby horizontal integration facility, lighting towers, water tower, and propellant tank farm for liquid methane and liquid oxygen. There will also be a rocket test stand. This pad and its infrastructure are cl clearly visible from the city's beaches looking northeast. Now, let's talk about who is utilizing the Cape for, as a launch site. There is no shortage of companies and government agencies. Each company and agency you are about to see, except for one at the end, all either have or will have operations and launches out of the Kennedy Space Center or the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The first, the, the first launch provider that we will be discussing is SpaceX, which was founded in 2002 by Elon Musk with the primary directive to get humanity to, the, to Mars and colonize it. SpaceX is perhaps one of the most well-known launch providers at the Cape due to their frequent breakthrough accomplishments and highly public vehicle test campaigns. The company launched 26 rockets last year alone and brought human spaceflight capabilities back to U.S. soil after a nine-year drought. In 2021, the company is eyeing an estimated 48 launch attempts. It has revolutionized the aerospace industry over the past decade with various achievements, one of the main ones being the perfection of returning orbital class boosters back to Earth safely for reuse, lowering cost and turnaround times. The company currently operates two different launch vehicles at two different launch pads, Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center and Pad 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. These two launch vehicles are the Falcon 9 rocket, which, is, which had its first flight in 2010, and the Falcon Heavy rocket, which had its first flight in 2018. The Falcon 9 rocket, seen on the left, has a payload capacity of 55,000 pounds. In terms of reusability, its entire first stage booster and its fairings are reusable. It uses liquid oxygen and RP-1 for fuel. RP-1 is essentially refined kerosene. Notable cargo includes Starlink satellites, which we'll talk about in a moment. It is human rated. And as said before, it has had its, it had its first launch in 2010 and is currently flown over 100 times. The Falcon Heavy has a payload capacity of 141,000 pounds. In terms of reusability, just like its Falcon 9 cousin, its boosters and its fairings are reusable. It uses the same type of fuel as the Falcon 9, and a notable cargo was a Tesla Roadster, which was utilized as a test bed for its first launch in 2018. It is not human rated. Let's talk more about SpaceX's reusability capabilities. Consider for a moment that after every time an aircraft took flight and landed, it was thrown away. Commercial air travel would never be economically viable. This is the key metric that many believed was holding rockets back from meaningful cost reductions. SpaceX, and now many others, are planning to make an entirely new reusable rocket fleet, much like an aircraft fleet. SpaceX currently reuses Falcon 9's first stage booster and Falcon Heavy's side and core boosters. The company has also begun reusing payload fairings that serve to protect cargo on ascent. The company has also begun, or excuse me, boosters either land at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station or hundreds of miles out at sea on drone ships that have wide open decks. Once a rocket has landed, the drone ships come back to Port Canaveral on their own where the rockets are offloaded by crane. SpaceX currently has two drone ships that utilize Port Canaveral. One is called, of course, I still love you, and the other is called, just read the instructions. SpaceX's next launch vehicle, simply called Starship, is currently under, under development in Boca Chica, Texas. Once completed, it will be one of the largest rockets in the world, standing at roughly 387 feet tall, and is intended to not only be fully reusable, but also be the company's primary means of transportation to the moon and Mars. The rocket will, will be so big, in fact, 
that Elon Musk has stated it will more than likely launch from sea-based platforms to reduce noise pollution and other risk associated with launches. Its first stage booster will have upwards of 29 engines. Let's, a little bit, let's learn a little bit more about Starship. Right now, it is expected that Starship will have a payload capacity of 100 metric tons. In terms of reusability, as stated, all components of the rocket will be reusable. For its fuel, it will use liquid methane and liquid oxygen. Notable cargo, Martian colonist. It will obviously be human rated and it's expected that its first launch, a test launch, will be in 2021 sometime. Quite often nowadays, a spec, uh, excuse me, a SpaceX launch will involve a Starlink payload. Starlink is a global satellite internet constellation that will use thousands of small flat satellites to beam high-speed internet anywhere on the planet. The constellation currently has upwards of 1,000 satellites in orbit, being launched 60 satellites at a time by a Falcon 9 rocket, as seen here. Beta testing has begun in the northern US and Canada, as well as parts of Europe for users. Full network service is expected globally within three years. The first Starlink launch was in February of 2018. Users of the Starlink constellation will use, small flat, will use a small flat dish to connect to the network and aim it skyward, an example of which can be seen in the upper left image. Profits derived from this network are intended to be used to fund further Mars colonization efforts. The next launch provider we will discuss is Blue Origin. Blue Origin is an aerospace manufacturer and suborbital spaceflight services company headquartered in Kent, Washington. It is not as flashy or public as SpaceX, but it is set to quickly become one of, it, one of its primary competitors and has already racked up some very impressive accomplishments, even in terms of reusability. Blue Origin began testing rockets all the way back in 2006 and now makes regular test flights of its new Shepard rocket, pictured here, which is named after Alan Shepard, the first American astronaut to reach space. New Shepard flies from Texas and is only designed to be suborbital in nature, meaning it basically goes up and comes right back down. New Shepard stands at 59 feet tall. In terms of reusability, its entire booster is reusable. It uses liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen as its fuel. Some notable cargo has been NASA science experiments. It is human rated and it had its first launch in 2015. New Shepard's testing is informing the design of the company's new Glenn rocket, which will launch from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station when completed. The new Glenn rocket, named after John Glenn, the first American astronaut to orbit the Earth, will be a super heavy lift rocket intended to, to take payloads into Earth orbit and beyond, including the moon. In terms of payload capacity, the new Glenn will have 99,000 pounds of payload capacity. In terms of reusability, its entire first stage booster, it will use liquid oxygen and methane as its fuel. It has not launched yet, so it has no notable cargoes to speak of. It will be human rated and its first launch is intended to be this year in 2021. This slide shows a, side comp a size comparison of New Glenn alongside some other notable rockets, dwarfing most of them. It will have a fully reusable first stage booster that will, like the Falcon 9 rocket, land on a ship out at sea and then return to Port Canaveral for reuse. This recovery ship is called the Jacqueline, named after Jeff Bezos's mother, and it will reside along the SpaceX recovery fleet in the port. The next launch provider we will discuss is the United Launch Alliance, or ULA. ULA has been successfully providing launch services for a number of years, well before Blue Origin and SpaceX. The company, which is a joint venture between Lockheed Martin and Boeing, was formed in December 2006. Since its founding, ULA has performed over 145 successful launches with a 100% success rate. 
The company's current operating launch vehicles are the Atlas V and the Delta IV Heavy. The Atlas V rocket stands at 191 feet tall and is able to be assembled in numerous launch configurations for different payload requirements. It has a payload capacity of 45,240 pounds. It does not have any reusability capabilities. Its fuel type is RP-1, liquid oxygen, and liquid hydrogen. Some notable cargoes include NASA's Curiosity rover, which was launched in 2011, and the recent launch of the Perseverance Mars rover. It is human rated, and its first launch was in 2002. It will eventually carry Boeing's CST-100 Starliner with astronauts aboard. The Atlas V is also notable for numerous other science missions that have progressed humanity's knowledge of the solar system. The Delta IV Heavy, seen here, is 236 feet tall and is one of America's largest rockets currently in use, aside from the Falcon Heavy. It has a payload capacity of 63,470 pounds. In terms of reusability capabilities, it does not have any. Its fuel type is liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Some notable cargo include a test campaign of, Orion's, of the Orion crew capsule for NASA back in 2014. It is not human rated and it had its first launch in 2004. It only has four launches left on the books before retirement, two from the Cape and two from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It is set to be replaced by this. The Vulcan Centaur rocket seen in the image on the right will be ULA's newest rocket and is set to have its first launch this year. It is sort of a hybrid between the Atlas V and the Delta and is expected to take over most of ULA's launches in the future. It will be up to 202 feet tall, 18 feet in diameter, and will be able to have up to six strap-on boosters for additional thrust. It will be able to lift 60,000 pounds of payload into low Earth orbit. ULA also is also planning for at least some of the rocket to be reusable. The lower engine block is slated to be detached once the first stage has finished firing and parachute back to Earth. But this feature, but it is, likely that this feature will not be used on the first few Vulcan launches. Before we moving on, the image on the left shows an Atlas V rocket with Boeing Starliner mounted on top for its maiden test flight in December 2019. The tower situated to the left of the rocket is relatively new, beginning construction in 2015, and is intended to be used by future astronauts to board the Starliner. ULA is on track to conduct eight launches, or excuse me, eight launch attempts in 2021 from the Cape. The Sierra Nevada Corporation does not have a rocket, but rather a space vehicle under development that will soon see frequent flights from the Cape, the Dream Chaser. The Dream Chaser is an orbital space plane, roughly 30 feet in length, that looks very reminiscent of the space shuttle, just miniaturized and unmanned. The Dream Chaser is designed to carry large amounts of cargo, over 12,000 pounds worth, to the International Space Station and will do so aboard a Vulcan Centaur rocket. The craft was originally intended to have its first flight in 2021, but the COVID-19 pandemic has delayed this until 2022, unfortunately. The Dream Chaser is meant to be reusable, landing as an aircraft would on a runway once it returns to orbit. In its early years of development, Dream Chaser was originally supposed to ferry people to and from the International Space Station. However, Sierra Nevada Corporation failed to be selected by NASA for its commercial crew program in favor of Boeing's Starliner and SpaceX's Crew Dragon. Firefly Aerospace is probably one of the more obscure launch providers on this list, but they are finalizing hardware and should be attempting a launch of their first ever rocket, the Firefly Alpha, which is pictured here on this slide very shortly, possibly within this quarter. Founded in 2017 and based in Austin, Texas, Firefly Aerospace is seeking to capture the small sat market of the emerging space economy, utilizing rockets that are far smaller than most we've seen already. One day, the company hopes to launch their rockets from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Launch Complex 20, but their first flight attempts are scheduled to be held at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The company is actively developing its Firefly Alpha and Firefly Beta rockets. The Alpha will be 95 feet tall 
and have a payload capacity of about 2,200 pounds. The Beta will be, used, will be just over 100 feet tall and will feature two strap-on boosters for more thrust. It, it will have a payload capacity of 8,820 pounds. Now let's talk about one of the newest entities utilizing the CAPE, the United States Space Force, the newest and smallest branch of the U.S. military. Established on December 20th, 2019, the U.S. Space Force, quote, organizes, trains, and equips space forces in order to protect U.S. and allied interests in space and to provide space capabilities to the joint force, unquote. In simple terms, the Space Force is intended to facilitate the protection, maintenance, and expansion of U.S. military satellites and other space assets in a time when other nations are rapidly expanding their own space-based operations, hopefully all in the interest of peaceful deterrence. It operates within the Department of Air Force in much the same way the Marines operate within the Department of Navy. Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and Patrick Space Force Base became the first official Space Force facilities last year formerly being called the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Patrick Air Force Base. The Space Force itself does not have any launch vehicles, but it does, however, have this. One of the Space Force's assets that is launched fairly regularly from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station is the X-37B space plane, seen on this slide. The X-37B is basically a miniaturized, unmanned military space shuttle that, has had, that had its first launch in 2010. Originally under the direction of the U.S. Air Force, the X-37B was transferred over to the Space Force after its establishment. The space plane is launched either with an Atlas V rocket or a Falcon 9 rocket and has been in space six times, with its latest launch being conducted last May. The space plane is still currently in orbit. These missions have often seen the X-37B stay in orbit for hundreds of days at a time the longest of which being an incredible 779 days. Much remains classified about the X-37B and its missions, but guesses point to material science studies, solar array testing, orbital surveillance, and some have even theorized the capture and return of small satellites via the space, plane, space plane's cargo bay. Now we come to the Space Launch System, NASA's next dedicated super heavy lift rocket. When completed, the SLS will be among the largest and most powerful rockets ever built and will hopefully one day soon send humans back to the moon and even beyond. Being one of the keystone, excuse me, being one of the keystones of NASA's Artemis program, the SLS will set the stage for a massive buildup of lunar infrastructure that will ultimately culminate in a permanent and sustainable human presence on the lunar surface by the end of the 2020s. SLS is set to have its first launch by the end of 2021, called the Artemis One mission, after years of delays, with its original first flight scheduled all the way back in 2017. But now the rocket is finally being assembled and testing has almost completed on all of its systems, paving the way for the Artemis One mission utilizing the Orion crew capsule. During this mission, the SLS will loft an unmanned Orion crew capsule around the moon on a three week journey to test systems and ensure safety in preparation for a manned mission about a year later. Every SLS configuration uses a massive core stage with four RS-25 engines left over from the space shuttle program. The first SLS vehicle called Block 1, seen here, can send more than 27 metric tons or 59,500 pounds in two orbits beyond the moon. It will be powered by twin five-segment solid rocket boosters and four RS-25 liquid propellant engines. After reaching space, the, inter the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or ICPS, set atop the core stage, will send the Orion capsule onto the moon. The first three Artemis missions will use a Block 1 rocket with an ICPS. The Block 1B crew vehicle will use a new more powerful exploration upper stage, or EUS, to enable more ambitious missions. The Block 1B vehicle can, in a single launch, carry the Orion crew, ca crew capsule along with large cargoes for exploration systems needed to support a sustained presence on the moon. The Block 1B crew vehicle can send 38 metric tons, or 
or 83,700 pounds to deep space, including Orion and its crew. Launching with cargo only, SLS has a large volume payload fairing to send larger exploration systems to the moon and Mars, or for science spacecraft on solar system exploration missions. The next SLS configuration, Block 2, which will most likely be built approaching the 2030s, will provide 9.5 million pounds of thrust and will be the workhorse vehicle for sending cargo to the moon, Mars, and other deep space destinations. SLS Block 2 will be designed to lift more than 46 metric tons, or 101,400 pounds, into deep space. In this image, we can see the SLS's core stage, undergoing testing at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. In this image, we can see the vehicle's twin solid rocket boosters beginning construction inside the VAB. And in this image, we can see a great size comparison of the SLS compared to other notable launch vehicles. Remember, this is showing the SLS Block 1 variant. They will only get larger from here. NASA will soon choose one of three proposed lunar lander designs for its Artemis program. Blue Origin, SpaceX, and Dynetics have all set forth plans for, to NASA for a privately built lunar lander, some of which would be carried into space via the SLS. Be sure to stay tuned to your local space news to see which design gets chosen. Finally, with an honorable mention, we have Virgin Galactic. Although this company does not have plans to fly from the Cape, I thought it would be insightful to show everyone this launch provider anyways, given their potential to shake up the current space race. Founded in 2004 by Richard Branson, the company aims to launch space tourists into suborbital flights in the very near future for the fee of around $250,000 aboard their, aboard their own space plane, the VSS Unity, which is pictured here. The Unity will be, will be joined by an uh, as yet unnamed sister space plane for expanded flight operations that is that is still under construction. Flights will be conducted out of the company's own private spaceport in New Mexico called Spaceport America. Besides passengers, Virgin Galactic is also set to host experiments for NASA and other scientific agencies on some of their flights as research missions. The Unity is scheduled to launch or be launched via an airdrop system. The Unity is carried to up to a predetermined altitude slung underneath its carrier aircraft, the EVE, pictured in the upper right corner. Once at the correct altitude, the Unity is dropped, ignites its rocket engine, and goes into space while its carrier aircraft returns to Spaceport America. This airdrop system allows the, the Unity to save precious fuel and probably makes for one wild ride. The Unity's first successful suborbital flight was in 2018. It is inspiring to see such levels of innovation and exploration right on the city's doorstep once more. The loss of the space shuttle program was defi definitely took an economic toll on the area, but now a revitalized space program is in full swing, and it is unlikely this one's momentum will ever really end. NASA alone generated more than $64 billion of economic impact in 2019, and $7 billion in tax revenue at the federal, state, and local levels. The space agency was responsible for 330,000 plus US jobs and it employs about 33,000 workers in Florida alone. And remember, this is just NASA. This doesn't even include the dozens of other companies that now call the Cape home. This year, over 50 launches are expected. Notable launches that could be seen this year include the first flight of ULA's Vulcan Centaur rocket, Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket, NASA's SLS rocket, and the first manned flight of Boeing's CST-100 Starliner. There will be ongoing Starlink launches, a Falcon Heavy launch, and many, many more in between. The space program has been intertwined within the city of Cape Canaveral's history since it was incorporated in 1963, and will continue to be so for years to come. The city will provide regular launch coverage on its media channels to ensure residents and visitors are aware of each launch, share traffic alerts for high-profile liftoffs, and issue sonic boom notices when necessary. The city, or be sure to follow us on all our social media channels and sign up for our weekly update via the city's website homepage. You can also text Brevard EOC, all one word, to 
1-800-777-777 to get launch alerts from the Brevard County Emergency Operations Center. If you have any questions regarding what you've seen in this webisode, please feel free to email me via the email address shown here. Be sure to subscribe to the city's official YouTube channel and hit the bell so you can get notified for all the latest Sustain a What webisodes. The next webisode, we will be discussing the topic of urban and community gardening. I've been Zach. I hope you have enjoyed this webisode. Thank you for watching and have a great day.